in studio from 90.5 WUOL Classical Louisville, broadcasting live from our performance studio in downtown Louisville. Good afternoon and welcome to WUOL Live as we present Kentucky Opera's Dead Man Walking. You can see the production on Friday, October 27th at 8 o'clock or Sunday, October 29th at 2 p.m. in the Brown Theater. I'm Daniel Gillum, your host for the show. You get to hear a lot of previews and uh, excerpts from the opera that will give you an insight into the production of Dead Man Walking. The first opera by composer Jake Heggie premiered in 2000 and a commission by the San Francisco Opera. It is one of the most successful American operas, and uh, Heggie's success has led to other operas like Three Decembers, which you also heard the Kentucky Opera present recently, as well as Moby Dick, Great Scott, and It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, composer Jake Heggie and librettist and award-winning playwright Terrence McNally first met in 1996 to talk about the opera collaboration with San Francisco. And what San Francisco wanted was something lighthearted and comedic for the new millennium. Uh, but the opera went in a very different direction. Um, Heggie and uh, McNally were not too thrilled about that idea, but started working on some other things. And first on that list was this book called Dead Man Walking by Sister Helen Prejean. They worked closely with Sister Helen, and she was on board from the beginning, uh, though she admittedly was not, uh, didn't know a lot about opera, but gave the duo their, her blessing and uh, uh, had one, one request, one mandate, and that was the opera had to remain a story of redemption. And this was something that both Hagia and McNally believed should remain as well. Uh, the story was compelling a Louisiana nun who becomes the spiritual advisor to a convicted murderer on death row and accompanies, accompanies him to his execution. Operatic it is. The story is very real. It's raw, and uh, it's difficult for audiences. Here is Ian Dare, general director of Kentucky Opera, to share uh, a little bit about the significance of what this opera means to contemporary uh, American opera and why, why were you moved to, to program it uh, here at Kentucky? Uh, thanks, Daniel. Uh, it is an incredibly important work, and uh, from my standpoint, it, it opens up so many uh, channels of communication. Uh, the first time I saw this work, it was, uh, it was almost gutting, and uh, the, the end of Act One, I, I really felt it was almost impossible to get out of my seat. There's this incredible ensemble, hair-raising, in fact, and uh, I, had, I had never really experienced anything like that. And then uh, you, you go out into uh, the, the intermission, and you, you realize that people are talking about things that you haven't seen people talk about before. And it was, it was an opportunity to uh, really explore something that, that, I mean, when you look at a convicted killer, uh, there, the opening scene of this opera is very uh, um, uh, complex and, and hard to watch. I mean, it is uh, a, a murder and, and a rape. And those two subject matters are not foreign to opera ever, really. I mean, they are familiar, but uh, what we see in this opera is different than what we've seen in other operas. And what happens, the, the complexity that arises and the way that, that the uh, situations present themselves that you would not have even, even allowed yourself to think about. I mean, that's the magic of this piece. That's the magic of, of Jake in, in uh, collaboration with Terrence McNally. I mean, of course, the, the book itself is incredible source material. So, the opportunity to do the Kentucky Opera premiere was was one that I really wanted to seize. Uh, I know that that also means that we can engage the community. Uh, it means that we can bring the composer here, uh, which is how often do you get to say that? It's exciting to know that Jake will be here for the opening of this. Uh, and, you know, we also have a, a cast that... By and large, with the exception, I, I think, of, of two artists are doing this for the first time. And that's uh, not only the cast, but the director and our conductor. I mean, that's, that's an epic thing to bring everybody going through this, this journey, as, as it's called uh, in so many ways, uh, together. So uh, it, it's an incredibly exciting opportunity. You pair all that drama with a, 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 a musical language that, that Heggie, uh, you know, you can't believe that this was this man's first opera. Mm. And, and you see how it grows, and, and uh, it's, it's an incredible experience. Mm. Ian Dare, General Director of Kentucky Opera, thank you so much. Thank you. 
So let's get let's get right to the story, and uh, we we pick up here with an intimate moment with Sister Helen Prejean as she prepares to meet inmate Joseph de Rocher for the first time. Please welcome Emily Fons as Sister Helen Prejean singing an excerpt from Dead Man Walking. <laughs> Emily Fons, the role of Sister Helen Prejean during Dead Man Walking by Jake Heggie, here live on 90.5 WUOL. You're listening to a preview of Kentucky Opera's next production. Uh, Emily, welcome to Kentucky Opera. This is your debut with the company, right? It is. Thank you for having me. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Uh, what did you do last? Sure. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And last, I was just doing another great modern American work, Jennifer Higdon and Jean Shear's Cold Mountain at North Carolina Opera in Raleigh. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Heard good things about that production in, in North Carolina. Oh, thanks. Um, ha, you know, this happens a lot in film and in movie where the actor plays a living character, a living person, uh, but it doesn't happen a lot in opera. What was it like no. uh, taking on a role that was autobiographical, someone who was still alive and, and you might even meet? Uh, right. Well, I think one of the most challenging things is that there's so much available to see of the great work that Sister Helen is doing now. And it's hard to remember that this opera is the very beginning of her journey. You know, so it's, it's finding the, the impetus and the, 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 the doubt and the personal struggle uh, that brings her to a point where she realizes that this is a, a message and a, a type of work that she wants to be involved in. So I think it's the kind of dialing back to a previous version hmm. and finding that kind of, um, finding her where she is when we start the opera. And, and how is that different from, you know, doing a, a Mozart role or a Verdi role? I mean, is it much more challenging or is it a little easier because 
there is so much that, that you can access right now. Well, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure everybody has their own opinion. Uh, I don't know that I find it easier or more difficult, but I would say that I prefer it. Mm. I, I just find that these modern stories, these um, living people are, are in a way just uh, e- maybe easier for me to access just kind of mentally. And, and I feel that I can bring a lot of myself to it, mm-hmm. uh, and it which, is, which is really freeing as well. Yeah. Thank you, Emily, for being here. You're going to be singing with Dennis Peterson in just a moment. Uh, we'll, we're continuing with Sister Helen as she travels to the prison to meet Joseph de Roche for the first time. And she meets Father Greenville, the warden, and uh, other inmates as they see her in prison. We, we pick up here with her first introduction to Father Greenville. Uh, he is, as many, feel that Joseph de Roche is beyond anyone's help. Please welcome Dennis Peterson as Father Greenville and Emily Fawns back as Sister Helen. Dennis Peterson and Emily Fawn singing excerpts from Dead Man Walking by Jake Heggie live on Classical Louisville. Um, Dennis, welcome to Kentucky Opera. Your first uh, time here too, right? Yes, it is. Thank you. But not your first time uh, doing the role. No, I did it a couple of times, once in, uh, at City Opera and then another time in Detroit mm-hmm. early on in its runs. Uh, tell us a little bit about, about yourself. Where are you from and uh, what, what did you do last? Um... I'm from Iowa. I grew up on a pig farm, so I have no reason to be here. Uh, <laughs> I wondered where that, that southern drawl came from, and that explains it. Um, I, uh, I'm chasing 64, uh, and uh, I've been doing this for about 40 years, um, and uh, uh, I still am not mature enough to uh, not uh, be self-conscious. So. <laughs> Well, you know, since this isn't your first time uh, doing this role, uh, you've studied it before, um, I, I am a little curious about this, the southern drawl aspect of your, your singing. I mean, normally we work on French and Italian dialect, but this time it's Louisiana, right? Well, uh, most of my, my, my specialty is Wagner and Strauss, um, so that's helped with this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> A sense of humor comes in handy, too. <laughs> what, what's it like coming back to this role? Um, it, it, it's fun, and uh, I'm going to be doing it again in, with Minnesota Opera coming up in January. Um, I, I, I find these characters to be uh, interesting because I brought, was brought up Catholic, hmm. and uh, being an opera singer, I'm also jaded. So uh, both of those things work very well with Father Grenville. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Dennis, so much. 
Joseph de Roche has a chance to go before the pardon board, um, but the plea is rejected and he remains on death row. The parents of the victims attend the meeting as well as Joseph's mother, Mrs. de Roche, and sister Helen. Please welcome back Emily Fons as sister Helen, Phyllis Pancella as Mrs. de Roche, and with her co uh, company debut as well, and some familiar faces, Emily Albrink as Kitty Hart, Chad Sloan as Owen Hart, Clara Neiman as Jade uh, Boucher, and Isaac Frischman as Howard Boucher. Sister Helen encounters the grieving parents in the parking lot while they await the verdict. And to hear Jake Heggie, the composer, captures the chaos and anguish in a beautiful and, and melodic sextet. Please welcome Emily Fons, Phyllis Pancella, Chad Sloan, Emily Albrink, Clara Neiman, and Isaac Frischman. Thank you all very much. Uh, Emily Fons, Phyllis Pancella, Chad Sloan, Emily Albrink, Clara Neiman, and Isaac Frischman singing music from Dead Man Walking by Jake Heggie. Phyllis Pancella joining me uh, here at the microphone. Uh, Phyllis, welcome to Kentucky Opera. Thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, tell us a little bit about, about yourself. Well, I'm from another river city, uh, St. Louis. Only about four hours away. I live in Tallahassee, Florida now, and I've been at the professional 
singing thing for a little over 30 years now. Wow, thank you. Uh, what, um, so, so these are all regular folks. They've just sort of thrown into this sort of mess, as JK calls it, thrown into a tornado. Um, they're all being tested and strained and, and pushed to the edge. Um, these are real people, you know, real lives. How, how do you put yourself, you know, in this, in this mother's position? Well, I have a 16-year-old son, so every time mm. I hear the beginning of this sextet and I think of, you know, the last thing I said to him the last time I saw him, that's, that's all it takes. It's not, uh, not a very long trip for me to think of how this could be. We raise our children the best that we can. We make the best decisions that we can. And then it's just not up to us. Things happen. So mm -hmm. there's enough loss and chaos in this, in this story to go around. Mm -hmm. Is this the first time for you doing this role? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Will it be the last? <laughs> <laughs> That's not something I get to predict, but sure. it's, a, it's, a, it's a, great, uh, a great role. And the, the role is sort of the, the in a way, um, one of the gray area pivot points because we go into a story of, of crime thinking we know who the good guys and bad guys are. Mm -hmm. We think we know where the darkness and light is, and we find out otherwise. Mm. Just like life. Yeah, right? exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, thank you, Phyllis, for being here. Thank you. Chad Sloan and Emily Albrink, um, is this your first time in... Kentucky? Uh, Such a nice place. Yeah, we love it. Yeah, no, of course, that is a very bad joke because <laughs> Chad Sloan and Emily Albrink are familiar faces to a lot of us. Uh, they're both professors at the University of Louisville, but uh, very uh, skilled singers who've traveled the world singing great opera and back at Kentucky Opera. Uh, what was the last thing? I was, uh, so I know you did Showboat, Emily. Mm -hmm. Chad, what was the last thing you uh, did? It was last season I sang In the Mikado. In the Mikado. Cuba. Yeah. And is this your first time with Dead Man Walking? Yes, both of our first yes, times. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Not first time with music by Jake Heggie. Um, right. Done a lot of his music, and this piece is just the best. <laughs> right. So you, you've known Jake for a long time, Emily. Uh -huh. uh, he's been in Louisville before, right? Doing mm -hmm. a master class. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Kentucky Opera and uh, University of Louisville brought him uh, in, oh my gosh, like 10 mm -hmm. years ago or something mm -hmm. uh, to give. And, and really, he kind of changed the whole culture uh, of the School of Music at UofL and hmm. or the voice department was really gave some incredible master classes and uh, we're actually gonna have him back uh, on October 27th on the opening uh, day mm -hmm. uh, for master classes at UofL from 10 to 12 and 1 to 3 uh, he's gonna work with some of our kids and we're just really thrilled it's very inspiring he can he's very inspiring but chad how do you prepare your students for something like that to, to have a master class with someone like jake Hagen? oh sure well what, what's what's exciting for us is obviously he has written so many beautiful wonderful songs that are actually very good for young voices mm -hmm. so uh we have kind of divvied them up among uh our great students and um we have been working with them for months now to make sure that everything is right and exactly how we want it when they get up there and uh, get to work with him. But at that point, it's, you know, it's not really about us. And it's in many ways, it's not even about them. It's mm -hmm. about, you know, exploring this beautiful music. And, and he picks amazing texts mm -hmm. uh, to work with. So it's, um, it's uh, really been a couple months of wonderful work with our students on some great music. I'm sure it'll be unforgettable for them. Um, I have no uh, doubt. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, good to see you both again. Okay. And thanks Thank for you. being here today. Sister Helen's mission is to help Joseph recognize and admit his own guilt. Um, he's yet to take responsibility for what he's done. He remains in denial and claims his brother was once the one who did those terrible things and, and murdered the teenagers. Uh, we welcome back Emily Fons as Sister Helen and returning to Kentucky Opera Morgan Smith as Joseph de Roche. Uh, here and singing parts of Dead Man Walking from Jake Heggie's opera presented by Kentucky Opera. In a lethal injection, I don't see it. Forgiveness, forgiveness, in our hearts and souls, John. No forgiveness. Our hearts and souls, I hate it when you 
sound like a nun. Forget that I'm a nun. Two young people are dead because of you. Their parents will never see them again. I believe you should admit your guilt what? and say your sorry what? to the parents of those children. Right, sure. And give the state the right to kill me. You may be a good nun. You'd make a lousy lawyer, sister. We both know I'm on a rare tractor. We both know that no one's gonna forgive me. Thank you both. Uh, Morgan Smith, welcome back to Kentucky Opera. You Thank were you. last year with uh, Madam Butterfly as Sharpless. Uh, what have you been doing since then? Oh, gosh. Um, a bunch. I got to do a uh, um, new premiere in uh, Arizona Opera, Riders of the Purple Sage. Um, I am one of those singers who gets to gets to do a decent amount of modern modern works, including some others by, uh, by Jake Heggie, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, Moby Dick. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, like Emily, uh, I do enjoy doing a lot of modern repertoire. Yeah. Um, there is a, a certain relevance, um, that, mm -hmm. that I enjoy about it. Um, mm -hmm. sort of impressions to, to our, our daily lives. And this, this piece is certainly no exception. What, what makes you, uh, the one who loves to do modern opera? Do, do you get picked because of your love for it? Or do you have a particular knack for Strange melodies and oh, odd that's a, you know, it's it's a great it's a great question. Um, I, I guess it was just sort of what I was offered. You mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. opera singing was something that I that I didn't know was a possibility. Um, growing up, I wanted to be a scientist, and somebody said, you know, this thing is there. You sh you can do it. You should probably do it. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing once I began singing happened with modern repertoire. Mm -hmm. um, people said, you know what? I like what you do. I'd like to hire you for this new piece that we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I also love singing in, in English, my native tongue. A lot of people don't, but I love exploring the colors, and mm -hmm. I, I love the immediacy mm -hmm. of um, expression that comes in singing English as a, as a native speaker. You've done a lot of Jake's work, uh, but this is your first time doing Joseph to Rocher, right? Or, or, or second time, maybe. Well, it's interesting. A year ago, um, when, when Ian Dare... Um, Kentucky Opera's general director offered me this role. Uh, this was going to be the first time, mm. and I'm I actually uh, I got an opportunity to do a little warm up in uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, mm -hmm. which um, I didn't know until then, but it was actually the easternmost part of North America. So I got to sort of go away to this remote place, mm -hmm. um, kind of go on this little pilgrimage to to start thinking about the role earlier this this spring. Uh, mm -hmm kind of a jump in situation, but uh, had a chance to do it then. And, and um, I do think, however, it, it really takes two productions to truly understand, at least to mm. understand a new role and to, sure. to sort of stamp it in. Well, so, um, uh, you know, what is unique to you or distinct about, about Joseph's music in particular, about his, his, the way he's written in, in the opera? 
Uh, his music is melodically very angular. Uh, he often sings in a uh, different tonality. Um, there's this um, theme, which I think is, is essentially Joseph's theme. Da, 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 mm-hmm. That keeps coming back, which often occurs kind of in a, um, against a different tonality. Mm-hmm. Um, Jake's writing, we found that in Moby Dick, hmm. um, um, there's some of that as well, mm-hmm. and I think it's really effective. He, he eventually, until really the end of the opera where there's a, a dramatic acquiescence, um, that's when we first start to really hear him mm-hmm. sing with others, sing in unison, and, mm. and sing within the tonality mm. of the piece. So uh, you're going to sing something else for us uh, from Dead Man Walking. Um, set up the, the scene for us of what you're going to sing next. Yeah, so um, one of the big challenges of this piece is you have to uh, sing an aria while doing push-ups. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Jake. Um, but I, uh, you know, I, for a few years I've been, I've been wanting to get in shape, and I, I thank Ian <laughs> for, for the opportunity. Um, so uh, this, this role and this aria are kind of notorious because you are out there essentially almost naked um, in your underwear, just a guy playing a guy who's in his prison cell um, with not much to do except work out, really. Mm. That's what prisoners often do. And he's, he's contemplating um, this really, the, the encounter with Helen has, has made him really think about this story that he keeps telling, which is, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. Mm-hmm. And even within the aria, we, we don't really... He references the girl and the boy, um, but he doesn't reference actually, actually killing them. Mm. He just references whether he remembers them or not. <laughs> um, and there's this constant, constant uh, struggle against the truth, and mm-hmm. we really see that manifested in a soliloquy really effectively at the beginning of Act Two, mm-hmm. where he's really defiant, physically defiant. We really see him, and it's really effective as an actor, mm-hmm. to get to really exert yourself physically and mm-hmm. manifest that defiance. Mm-hmm. Let's hear it. Oh, 
Joseph goes to hell. So I keep coming back, sister. What do you want? Nobody's gonna hear me say it. I ain't sorry for a thing. I'm August 4. Says, do what you gotta do. But if y'all think killing's so bad, look at what you're doing. Let's go. Morgan Smith singing the role of Joseph de Roche from Dead Man Walking by Jake Heggie. You're listening to a live broadcast from 90.5 WUOL, Classical Louisville. And we're hearing Kentucky Opera in this uh, WUOL live presentation. I'm Daniel Gillum. Sister Helen is haunted with nightmares about the murdered teenagers. Sister Rose comforts her and helps her admit she still has to find the strength to forgive Joseph herself, just as mothers forgive their children's failings. Please welcome Emily Fonz as Sister Helen and Karen Slack as Sister Rose. Thank you. 
Emily Fons and Karen Slack singing Sister Helen, Sister Rose, respectively, from Dead Man Walking by Jake Heggie. Welcome, Karen. Thank you. Is this your first time in Kentucky? No. <laughs> I used to live in Lexington. I've heard of it. Yes, yes. Go oh, Big Blue. <laughs> enemy territory. No, I, um, my husband was finishing his degree at UK, so we, we moved there. We just moved back to Philadelphia, which is my hometown okay. in May. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell us about your relationship with this role, Sister Rose. <laughs> this is my fifth production of Dead Man Walking. I don't know. Somebody kind of likes me in the part, so they call me, you know? <laughs> it's kind of cool because I normally do the, the bigger heroines, the Verdi and the Puccini role, mm -hmm. so it's nice to not have the whole opera on my shoulder you know <laughs> floating the high sea at the end you know all that sure, kind of sure, stuff right, you know? right. it's kind of nice to be funny to, as well so right yeah, yeah you, so you do bring some levity to the conversation to the to the the opera yes. how do you feel about that it's a serious opera it is i always say that it's nice to play roles i like playing roles because everyone likes her mm. where everyone just kind of feels indifferent about everybody else uh-huh everyone likes you it's yeah. nice to be liked <laughs> It's kind of nice to be liked. And the relationship I always um, like with um, the Helens that I have, I've mm -hmm. always all had different Helens. Mm -hmm. And so it's all about, I mean, the only way it really, I think, goes over is if you have a good relationship with Helen, if the audience sees that, mm. you know, um, and that they believe it. Mm -hmm. So, so you have to really important. develop a genuine relationship with your counterpart. In, or be in, yeah. really good at <laughs> <laughs> But I like Emily, so very much. <laughs> well, we we won't go any further. Right. You know, uh, but uh, but thank you, uh, thank you for being here today. It's nice to hear you sing. Thank and, you, and sing, Sister thank Rose. You. Karen Slack, everyone. <laughs> Uh, please welcome uh, the stage director. We've heard from a lot of singers. Now let's hear from someone who you won't hear from, but you'll see her work on stage, Ellen Douglas Schlafer, uh, to share her insights into the work. Uh, welcome, Ellen. Thank you very much. Uh, this is your uh, debut with Kentucky Opera, yes, right? Yes, it is. Uh, where are you from, and what are some recent productions that you've done? I'm from Columbia, South Carolina, where I am the director of opera studies for the University of South Carolina, where I also maintain a freelance career. And I guess my most recent was The Little Prince for the Houston Grand Opera, and a month before that was Tosca for the Dallas Opera. Hmm. So I have lots of different jobs. Yeah, a little all, all over the map uh, with your recent work. Well, um, when you start an opera driving a truck, there's no way but up. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, welcome to Kentucky. Um, we can't wait to see your work on stage. Um, it's a it's a difficult opera. I mean, there's no way around it. We have to start there. Um, graphic scenes, uh, difficult uh, uh, things to talk about, rape, murder. Um, how do you approach directing these sorts of things? With a lot of prayer mm. um, and with great colleagues. We're very fortunate in our production to have two young actors from Louisville, uh, Megan and Cameron, and we're assisted by uh, Barrett Cooper, who's helping us with, with the fight stuff. Mm -hmm. But this is, it, it is very difficult material, and it is a... Uh, the composer and librettist wanted these things to be seen on stage. Mm -hmm. They were constantly reminded of, of what happened to uh, spark uh, all of the stuff that follows. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's different from doing a, a film. You're, you have that, that distance when you're when seeing this type of graphic violence mm -hmm. in film. But this is live. This is theater. And it's uh, one of the things that theater can do best. It can... Uh, sap you up and, and wrap your heart around it and uh, take you in a place that you can't always do in film. And I think it's, it is horrific. It was a horrific deed. And mm -hmm. the results of the, the, uh, that we see, the execution on stage, um, we're, we're constantly reminded of it, and that's what I think the, the reason to have such a, a graphic portrayal at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your research in getting ready for this uh, 
this production, the film, the book, uh, how did you get into a space where you wanted to, where, where you could create your own vision without the, maybe the baggage of, of the, the film? Well, you, I always start with, with the music mm-hmm. and the score. That's your Bible. Um, then I went to Sister Helen's books and read those a couple of times. And uh, the last thing I did was watch the film. Mm. Um, and then you go back again to the music. And the music is, is so well-crafted. Mm-hmm. And uh, with the libretto by a man of the theater, um, Terrence McNally, and I've directed a couple of his plays before, so you know that, that work, the worked so well together, it, it wasn't hard mm. to, to you just go back to what the score and the music say mm. and, and rely on incredible colleagues. Sure. Including our, our conductor, um, Joseph Mekovich, who has two orchestra rehearsals today, so that's why he's not with us. So. And that's a great sag. I, I didn't even set you up for that. Uh, but thank you, Ellen Douglas yeah. Schleifer, for being here today. <laughs> Uh, she took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, Joe Mekovich is not here today because he is with the orchestra going through this score. Um, but I did have a chance to chat with the Maestro Mekovich yesterday. He came into the studio, and uh, here's a little bit of what he said about Jake Heggie's Dead Man Walking. We have to remember that opera is a theatrical art form. And it's really based in theater. So that premise, when we say something about new opera, we need to know that we're going to have a story that is speaks to us because it's usually new, new operas pulled from stories that are contemporaneous. Um, what is so great with Jake, though, is that it can be summed up in this one phrase. Everything he does, he does in service of the story. Everything he chooses to do, he does to, uh, to tell the story so that the audience member understands that. So... His his choices, his musical sounds, his his the world that his sonic world that he creates, is fits the dramatic moment here. So when you have in this very difficult story um, moments of of strife, moments of of violence, moments of 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 anger, you you have that sound just you, like you do in a, in a in a movie that you see in the movie theater. In moments of serenity, in moments of 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 thinking of of the character thinking about his or herself, you have. Um, Jake's voice, which is a, a, a vocal line that is singers love to sing. It fits the voice nicely. It's uh, the vocal line is determined by the text, the way the text moves, and sonically it is accessible. Now there's another word that can turn into being toxic, but it is it's it's a it's a sound that we are all very much accustomed to as Americans on this continent. It has uh, melodies. That, that soar and, and tunes that are accessible to, to who we are. The wonderful thing about Dead Man Walking and the way that uh, Jake and Terrence McNally work together is telling the story. It's not, uh, it's not set up to be an either-or situation, whether you're for or against. It really is about this woman, Sister Helen Prejean, and her journey through this, 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 this topic. And you see all sides of it. So it's, it's not a, an, uh, meant to have you decide what, what you believe in, but to just show this woman's transformation, this, this very important woman in our, in our society today who's still alive, doing what she feels is, what is her calling, her duty. Do you think that knowing the film can change how you experience the opera? Or should we just leave the film at home or at the doorstep before we go to the opera? Well, we can't escape that, can't we? You know, I mean, look, Jake Jake has tackled um, Dead Man Walking, which everyone knows by the movie, not even Sister Helen Bajan's book. He's ta- ta- tackled the subject called Moby Dick, right? And condensed that enormous novel, he and Gene, down to a less than three-hour opera. And then he did another iconic uh, uh, thing, um, It's a Wonderful Life. So I... Th- Opera comes out of, uh, I don't want to say pop culture, but what's happening today. You know, the Beaumarchais trilogy during Mozart's time was the Daniel Steele. Everyone was reading that, right? Donizetti, Lucia de Lama, more of them was reading um, Scott's novella. So it was, you pull from that. You pull from that. So everyone has, oh, I've seen that movie. Let's go see this take on it. So evaluating this opera... Uh, now 17 years <laughs> after its premiere, and, and one of the most successful Absolutely. American operas, for yep. sure. Uh, how, how have your feelings changed about it over time? Well, this is the first time I've done this piece, you know, and this is Jake's first opera. Um, 
even since we began this journey, and that phrase is, is uh, predominant throughout this piece because it is a journey for the characters to go through um, and Sister Helen Prejean and just the artists, you know, through this this topic. Um, I mean, this journey, it's it's a very heavy feeling in the rehearsal room, what you're, you're going through. Um, what you're what you're exploring uh, through all sides of the the death penalty issue, uh, it's it's you see every nuance of it in a, in an authentic and honest way, um, and it, it, it accesses you as an audience member as an artist. I mean, it, it challenges you, and we've that's what we love in theater. We love to be challenged. That's Joey Mekovich, the conductor, the maestro of the production of Dead Man Walking by Jake Heggie, which is coming up with Kentucky Opera. We have one more excerpt for you today featuring Emily Fons, Morgan Smith, and Evan Boyer, as well as Dennis Peterson. Uh, welcome back, these four folks, uh, to sing more from Dead Man Walking by Jake Heggie. Um, Emily, I'm wondering if you can uh, just talk a little bit about um, this scene, what's going to happen here in this excerpt. Sure. Uh, this is the last time we see Helen and Joe able to talk to each other. And Helen is very aware that the clock is ticking for Joe, but also the clock is ticking for her to connect with him about the truth of what he did and, and the power of forgiveness and redemption. And the, the excerpt we're about to sing is immediately after Joe has confessed uh, to killing the two children. And... And Helen wants him to know so desperately that he's still a child of God. He's still a human. He's still a child of God. And, and there's still love and forgiveness for him regardless. Uh, and then we um, meet the Father Grenville and the warden as Joe begins his, his walk to his execution.
saying it unless the sister has an objection of course not father find that dead man walking On 90.5 WUOL, you've been listening to excerpts from Dead Man Walking by Jake Heggie. Playing uh, and uh, performing more music than anyone else today, Emily Jarrell Urbanke at the piano. Please give her a round of applause, too. Yeah. And you can see Kentucky Opera's Dead Man Walking by Jake Heggie on Friday, October 27th at 8 o'clock or Sunday, October 29th at 2 o'clock in the Brown Theater. You can find out more at kyopera.org. Next week, uh, we've got some studio artists from the Kentucky Opera singing some songs of Poulenc and Bellini and Beethoven and Libby Larson's Try Me, Good King, The Last Words of the Wives of Henry VIII. Joanna Latini and Connor McDonald will be here in this very space next week. So come and join us next week at noon, next Wednesday at noon, for some more great music. Thanks to Eric Matthews and uh, Kojin Tashiro providing sound today. Tyler Franklin for our video and Facebook Live work. Thanks to City Cafe for lunches. And thanks to you, our listener members. Your support makes programs like these possible. Thank you to our live audience here at 90.5 WUOL Classical Louisville. We'll see you next Wednesday for more great music. Have a great afternoon. In studio from 90.5 WUOL Classical Louisville.